They might be called the Peace Olympics, but behind the scenes, there's tension everywhere at South Korea's Winter Games and not just on the ice. The unified Korea women's hockey team was created to serve as a symbol of peace, cooperation, and hope between the two Koreas. But the players aren't feeling the love, and forward Randy Griffin says some of them are playing like competitors, not teammates. There was this moment during one of our games in the Olympics where I had been on the ice with a North Korean and I made a pass to her in front of the net and she was able to get a good shot off but didn't score. And then when we got back to the bench, one of my South Korean teammates, she just tapped me and said, hey, don't pass to them in front of the net. We don't want them to score because we don't want people to think that they helped us and that they should keep unifying us in the future. And so that was a, a very real tension throughout the games. This tension among the team is mirrored among South Korea's Olympic organizers, who still don't know who hacked them on the opening night. Initial evidence points towards Pyongyang and the Lazarus Group. But are critics of Kim Jong-un jumping to conclusions? That peacemaking pledge for Olympic unity was, after all, his proposal. So would he really be the Olympic destroyer? And if he's not, then who is, and what are they seeking to gain? From the BBC World Service, this is The Lazarus Heist, Season 2. I'm Jean Lee. And I'm Jeff White. Episode 6, False Flags. After a sample of the Olympic Destroyer code is uploaded to a security database, researchers around the world furiously race to figure out how it works and who's behind it. Among the investigators is Warren Mercer in Northern Ireland. He and his team at Cisco Talos are plugged in, scanning blogs and forums, sharing info with the rest of the cybersecurity community. Warren soon learns that another team looking at the code has found something interesting. They find a match between sections of the code used to hack the Olympics and malware used in attacks that have been widely attributed to alleged Chinese hacking groups. No other groups were using code quite like this. It's a distinct set of fingerprints, but pointing to a completely different attacker. So we now have got reason to believe that it's um, alleged North Korean groups. We now have reason to believe it's alleged Chinese groups. Everyone's sort of a bit confused at this point. It's all starting to sound very CSI. A crime with multiple suspects with two sets of fingerprints. That's not uncommon. Hackers don't want to get caught, so they borrow each other's code. They sometimes even throw in foreign languages to confuse investigators and cover their true identity. Security researchers call these false flags. So false flags are deliberately inputted pieces of code or deliberately inputted references or naming conventions that make you think, oh, it was those guys, or oh, it was those guys, when in reality, it probably wasn't those guys. So if this were a crime show, then we have the real suspect planting someone else's DNA at the crime scene to confuse the forensic investigators. Exactly, and the challenge now is to figure out which is the false flag. Warren's seen these tactics before, but what's impressive about Olympic Destroyer is the sheer number of false flags in the code and the lengths the hackers have gone to construct them. It's almost as though making the hack confusing was just as important as making it destructive. Warren's never seen anything like it. We now have the most deceptive malware ever created. Certainly that I'm aware of. I can't think of another one that has those levels of false flags to that level of ability. So its whole ethos, whenever you started putting things apart at it and looking at it, was basically about trying to finger point at other people. Warren soon learns that another top researcher, this time at the Russian security company Kaspersky, has made an interesting breakthrough. It was an amazing find and one that most people would have missed. Looking at one particular part of the malware, the Kaspersky expert finds a telltale piece of what looks like Lazarus code in there. So that seems to point back to North Korea, right? Well, these particular sequences of code don't actually seem to do anything. They don't have any function in the hack itself. They've been very deliberately copied and pasted into the code just to point a finger at North Korea. So some of the North Korean evidence is definitely planted, definitely fake, and whoever did create Olympic Destroyer wanted to blame it on the Lazarus Group. We've now written out North Korea, arguably, arguably. So that just leaves China, right? Wrong. Like any great whodunit, a third suspect emerges from the shadows. 
Delving deeper still, another astonishing piece of evidence is uncovered. This new info suggests that whoever was responsible for the Olympic destroyer attack is also responsible for cyber attacks on Ukrainian targets, companies, government agencies and activist groups, and this lead points towards Russia. Then, investigators find the closest thing yet to a smoking gun. They link the hack on the Olympics to a specific website address, which, according to the FBI, was tied to hackers who targeted the 2016 US presidential elections. You might remember that in 2016, there was widespread outcry about Russian state-sponsored hacking groups allegedly interfering with that election. It's an allegation that Russia has continually denied, but US intelligence and the Department of Homeland Security have been confident in accusing Russia. So now, at the 2018 Winter Games, the evidence strongly suggests that the culprits behind the Olympic destroyer attack were not in fact from North Korea or China, but instead working out of Russia's military intelligence agency, the GRU. It's a hacker unit known by various names depending on which security investigator you ask. Sandworm, Telebots, Voodoo Bear, Iron Viking. Don't let these kooky names fool you. This is one of the most effective and devastating hacking teams on the planet. At this point, the evidence pointing towards this Russian group starts to overwhelm anything pointing towards North Korea or China. So now we've got the suspect. What about a motive? Well, remember, Russia had been banned from the 2018 Winter Games. Russia will not be competing in the Winter Olympics in 2018 in South Korea. The reason the Russian state has colluded with the Russian sporting establishment to dope Russian athletes. Now, it's important to point out here that Warren Mercer's team at Cisco Talos, and indeed most cybersecurity professionals, will say they're not in the business of attributing attacks. They try and keep out of the politics. So instead, they'll say this malware strongly resembles code previously attributed to a certain threat group they've identified. That's part of the reason these groups get their funny names, like Lazarus Group and Voodoo Bear, because cybersecurity companies are very careful not to say North Korea did this or Russia did this. So in the days after the hack, with the Olympics still in full swing, Warren's team published their evidence without making an attribution. And other experts do the same. The games continue without any further cyber disruption. The threat has abated. And despite news headlines pointing out the strong likelihood that Russia was behind it, no one officially calls them out on it and Russia issues a forceful denial. So going on the evidence from investigators around the world, Russia has attempted to sabotage South Korea's Olympics, has tried to blame North Korea, and has seemingly gotten away with it. But in the corridors of the US government, the investigation continues. It takes a couple of years, but in October 2020, the US government goes public with its findings and makes several allegations against the Russian state. Then Assistant Attorney General for National Security, John Demers, addresses the room at the Department for Homeland Security in Washington, D.C. Today we announce criminal charges against the conspiracy of Russian military intelligence officers who stand... The U.S. Department of Justice charges Russian state-sponsored hackers with a number of attacks on targets ranging from the power grid of Ukraine to the 2017 French elections. Next, the conspirators turn their sights on the Winter Olympics, the conspirators, feeling the embarrassment of international penalties related to Russia's state-sponsored doping program, that is, cheating, took it upon themselves to undermine the games. Their cyber attack combined the emotional maturity of a petulant child with the resources of a nation state. The work of a petulant child, if indeed Russia was behind this, it seems they only did it to lash out in revenge after being excluded from the Olympic Games. But for the tech security community, the legacy of the Olympic destroyer hack was something deeply troubling. Those false flags were so convincing. Warren says this threatens to undermine the confidence of reverse engineers, cyber investigators like him who analyse malware for clues to work out who might be behind it. Which is quite scary to think about. Another friend of mine, he described this as like psychological warfare on reverse engineers. Yeah, yeah, it's really difficult because you, you, everything that you think the person who's trying to wrong foot you might have thought as well and wrong footed you knowing what you're about to think. God, it's yeah, you're right, it is psychological warfare. Exactly. Researchers are now worried they'll see more innovation with false flags in future, greater and greater dissembling. 
It raises the risk that a government might accuse the wrong nation for a cybercrime. A cyber war could become a hot war and could even mean loss of life. It's a scary thought, but there's another thing about this false flag attack. It looks like the Lazarus Group are now such rock stars of the hacking world that other groups are trying to imitate them, trying to pin their work on the North Koreans, because they know the Lazarus Group are the first suspects investigators will point a finger at. The idea that the Lazarus Group would hack these games never made sense to me. The North Koreans had put everything into this Olympic charm offensive. Kim Jong-un even sent his sister, Kim Yo-jong, to attend. She was the first member of North Korea's ruling family to visit South Korea. So this was a historic moment. And those images of her, dressed with demure glamour, shaking hands with South Korea's president, they were a diplomatic coup. Kim Jong-un had nothing to gain from a hack that might disrupt these games and jeopardize this important propaganda moment. And speaking of Kim Jong-un's Peace Olympics charm offensive, Whatever happened to Randy Griffin and her teammates? Things seemed pretty tense there. Well, as the competition went on, the ice did begin to melt a little among the players. It turns out that away from the cameras and their minders, some of the North Korean athletes had a playful side. And that doesn't surprise me at all. The North Koreans I know are very affectionate. And one of them was particularly drawn to a Korean-American player called Marissa Brandt. I guess some of it was just like a, a vibe, like Mar- Marissa's a very sweet and laid back person. And I think that this particular North Korean player was drawn to to that. And then Marissa would give her her phone whenever we were in the locker room and no one was watching. And then this North Korean would just scroll through all of her pictures and would just go way back into her history. And, you know, you would see her picking out a particular photo, often of Marissa, with other people. And this girl was clearly very interested in in Marissa's life, and you would see her zoom in on people's faces. And she wouldn't ask a lot of questions, but clearly was curious and would, like, indicate to Marissa when they were in the locker room together, hey, can I, can I look on your phone? Um, and then would just start this scrolling. Marissa's phone gives this young North Korean woman a peek into an alternate universe, life in America as a Korean. I can just imagine how fascinated she must have been by those photos, so unlike the images she sees in the anti-American propaganda back home. In the end, the unified Korean team lost all their games, but Randy Griffin made history by scoring the first ever goal for any Korean hockey team at an Olympic tournament, and she fulfilled her childhood dream of playing at the Olympic Games before heading back home to grad school. Her North Korean counterparts, meanwhile, went back over the DMZ, but not without tears. There was sort of a dinner, and then they departed on a bus. So, so yeah, there was some some ceremony surrounding that, and, and some of the South Korean players were, were crying and definitely were, were moved by the experience. I know from my own experience that you can't help but build a connection with North Koreans when you're with them day in and day out. It's only human. And in the process of getting to know one another, you also realize when you say goodbye that you might never see one another again. The stakes are high for these young North Korean women. It's not just the pressure to perform for their country. They also need to show they weren't overly influenced by South Korea or the West while they were overseas. And that usually means they'll have to face some sort of re-education when they return home. A few weeks after the games, Randy bumps into a sports reporter who had a chance to speak to some of the North Korean players. And Randy says she asked the reporter, how will the North Korean people feel when they hear that an American scored the first goal for the unified Korea team? Don't they hate us? This was when she told me, oh, no one there knows anything about any of this, right? And she had talked to the North Korean players about their experience and asked them if they were like big celebrities in North Korea now. And they just flatly answered, no, like nobody in North Korea knows about this. Wow. And I remember that just hit me like, wow, this was a completely one-sided bullshit thing. Like they they came and showed the world, oh, look, we're normal and like that and that. But then they go home and it's not normal at all. Like how weird is that? What I saw happen at the Olympics was basically like 
very positive publicity for North Korea. I mean, I guess for me, that just reaffirms like, wow, what an oppressive country. And I, I feel sorry for them. Not sure how I feel about giving North Korea the platform to pretend like they're normal. A platform to pretend like they're normal. Randy makes a good point. From a distance, North Korea's participation may seem like a golden opportunity for peace and sports diplomacy. But up close, it can feel like theater that succeeds in enhancing Kim Jong-un's reputation, but does little to improve the lives of the North Korean people. And to some extent, it worked for him. There were headlines that Kim had won the gold medal for diplomacy. There were even calls for the hockey team to be nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. All this Olympic goodwill generated some positive press for North Korea, briefly distracting from its reputation as one of the most repressive authoritarian states on Earth. Kim Jong-un had been carefully crafting this moment. He's proven to his people he can defend them. He's lowered the temperature on the Korean Peninsula, and now he's ready to step into a new role as diplomatic statesman. This is going to lead to one of the strangest chapters in relations between the United States and North Korea. We're talking love letters, Elton John, and the world's most unlikely bromance. After nearly being derailed by a cyber attack, South Korea's Winter Olympics end up a resounding success. To the relief of the hosts, their northern neighbour behaves, and with relations between the two countries warming up, Kim Jong-un seizes this opportunity to ask a favour of his new friends in the South. He wants them to deliver a message to none other than the President of the United States. In March 2018, a few weeks after the game's end, South Korean officials arrive at the White House with an invitation from Kim Jong-un. He wants to meet President Trump face to face. No sitting US president had ever held a summit with a North Korean leader before. Previous presidents had been wary that a summit would hand the regime a potent propaganda coup. But Kim Jong-un is betting that President Trump might think differently. While campaigning, Trump had already hinted that he'd be willing to meet with Kim, and he boasted that he was the man who could finally persuade Kim to abandon his nuclear weapons program. One of the papers called the other day, and they said, would you speak to the leader of North Korea? I said, absolutely, why not? Who the hell cares? I'll speak to anybody. I'm only going to make a good deal for us. Donald Trump accepts the invitation immediately, and everyone gathered in the Oval Office, the visiting South Koreans, the White House staffers, are surprised by his quick response. Kim Jong-un has dedicated huge resources into his weapons program, to the detriment of his own people. He spent billions of dollars, some of it most likely the proceeds of the country's alleged hacking operations, which, by the way, it denies, to build North Korea into a credible nuclear threat. And now, he wants to discuss giving it up? Maybe he really does want to come in from the cold. I never thought it was a good idea, and I believe that it was very clear that North Korea was never going to be talked out of its nuclear weapons program. This is John Bolton. Back in 2018, he was national security advisor to President Trump, and previously he had served as an advisor to President George W. Bush, as ambassador to the UN, and he's a prominent hawk in American political circles. He often emphasizes that the United States should be tougher with its adversaries. And this hasn't won him any love in North Korea. State media there once called him human scum and a bloodsucker, an accolade he said he was pleased to receive. And actually, we should say here, Donald Trump's no longer very keen on John Bolton either. The two men have had a somewhat public falling out. But back in 2018, he was right by the president's side. Bolton's role is to support and advise the president. But he's pretty dismayed that Donald Trump has agreed to this summit, and he doesn't think he's doing it for the right reasons. Trump saw all this through the prism of how does this benefit Donald Trump? How can he maximize the impact of it? And uh, he thought being able to to say he was the first American leader to meet with the leader of North Korea would be something that would be of enormous political benefit to him. There's almost certainly some ego at play, for sure. Perhaps Donald Trump's thinking, OK, previous presidents have all failed to bring North Korea under control, but I'm the man who wrote the art of the deal. How hard can it be? Trump didn't fully understand what the nuclear proliferation problem was. He didn't know anything about the technical aspects of nuclear weapons or ballistic missiles. He said many times that he thought 
the essence of foreign policy, I guess, much like the essence of real estate development, is that you size your adversary or the person across the table up as soon as you can, and then the personalities involved make acceptable deals. Donald Trump sends Kim a letter thanking him and formally agreeing to the summit. And Kim sends a letter in response. Just months earlier, these two men were threatening each other with nuclear annihilation. Now they're pen pals. Kim addresses Trump as Dear Excellency and goes on to say, I am prepared to cooperate with you in sincerity and dedication to accomplish a great feat that no one in the past has been able to achieve and that is unexpected by the whole world. Despite these epistolary assurances, mixed messages from Pyongyang leave the president second-guessing whether Kim might try to cancel the whole summit. Trump at one point said to me, uh, as he was calculating what, what his next move would be, that uh, when he was dating, he never liked to have the girl break up with him. He always wanted to be the one who broke up with the girl. So from his perspective, if this summit was going to be canceled, he wanted to be the one that did it, not having it canceled on him like he's the disappointed suitor. In the end, it's Donald Trump who cancels the summit after preparations hit a rocky patch. So Kim dispatches an envoy who arrives at the White House clutching a huge envelope, what looks like an oversized Valentine's Day card. He's photographed handing it over to a beaming president. The letter from Kim Jong-un, uh, he just thought was the best letter he had ever seen. It was a, a conscious effort to flatter Trump, to convince him that they thought he was very special. That was the beginning of a series of exchanges of letters between Kim and Trump that uh, had little or nothing to do with the substance of North Korea's nuclear weapons program, but had everything to do with Kim trying to flatter Trump and, and Trump trying to show that he was at the center of the, the whole drama. What does this say about the North Koreans and Kim Jong-un and their understanding of Trump and how he operated? Well, I'm afraid the answer is they understood him very well. The summit is back on. A location is finalized, the resort island of Sentosa in Singapore. So now it's time for Trump's team to talk tactics. The United States and its allies have been trying for decades to get North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons and destroy any facilities for making and testing new ones. Kim Jong-un's grandfather and father both signed nuclear deals with the United States promising to freeze or dismantle their programs in exchange for economic aid and concessions, only for North Korea to renege on them. John Bolton is worried President Trump is going to fall into the same trap with Kim Jong-un. Well, the classic North Korean negotiating style is that they would commit to doing something partial in terms of eliminating their nuclear weapons program with the implication there'd be a long follow-up period. It would take a number of years to completely dismantle the nuclear program. That schedule would kind of drag on while at the same time they would get upfront economic benefits. It was that kind of thing I felt Trump was very vulnerable to falling for. But he's having a hard time conveying that to the president. And it became evident uh, fairly clearly that uh, a lot of the detail, a lot of the briefing materials were things he just didn't read. So it was important to try and find a few minutes here or there to try and explain what was at stake. John Bolton suspects the president is more interested in the media coverage. When we were in Singapore, uh, he was fascinated with being briefed on how many reporters there were, how many TV cameras there'd be, the number kept getting bigger and bigger, at least in his mind, 200, 400, uh, eventually just got out of control. And I think that's what fascinated him. So it was the drama in the theater. It was the attention on Donald Trump. And it was a spectacle, with the world's media descending on Sentosa to capture this historic moment, cameras snapping as the two men stride toward one another and shake hands. The rapport between the two men is remarkable. After all, just six months earlier, after a North Korean missile launch, Trump was calling Kim... Little rocket man. But at the Singapore meeting, according to Bolton, Trump tries to turn that into a joke, or even pass it off as a compliment. He asks Kim if he knows the singer Elton John. He decides he wants to give Kim a CD featuring Elton's hit song Rocket Man as a gift. I think Kim Jong-un missed most of the joke, but I think for Trump it was, uh, for whatever reason, he felt if you could get him the Elton John 
a CD or whatever it was, that that would explain everything. But it just showed Trump's obsession with, with trying to get a personal relationship with Kim over something as trivial as this uh, song. Meanwhile, Kim Jong-un has a little fun of his own with John Bolton, the man North Korean media had previously described as human scum. He did have a sense of humor. At one point, he said to me, uh, you know, I see, Mr. Bolton, you've said a lot of not very nice things about North Korea over the years, but uh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell my hardliners you're not such a bad fellow after all. He was enjoying himself. I think he felt he was uh, in control. There's a lot of banter, but not a lot of specifics when it comes to dismantling North Korea's nuclear program. Kim promises not to carry out nuclear tests. Trump pledges to suspend some joint U.S.-South Korean military exercises. But he pushes off any discussion about alleviating sanctions. The summit ends with the two leaders signing a joint statement. But it's brief and vague. Not that you'd know from Trump's comments. The letter that we're signing is very comprehensive. And I think both sides are going to be very impressed with the result. There was a declaration issued at the end of the Singapore summit that I was very thankful said essentially nothing because it meant we hadn't made any concessions. This statement includes the line that North Korea commits to work toward complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Essentially, these talks have ended, but let's keep talking. But Ambassador Bolton thinks that for Kim Jong-un, just the summit itself was a victory. I think Kim was ecstatic. He had just met with an American president, uh, the two of them equal on the world stage, shaking hands together. Uh, I thought it was a huge loss for the United States. I don't think Trump ever understood that. He thought the press conference had been uh, a huge success because it was so long and so large, and uh, he was delighted with it. At the press conference, Trump praises Kim, calling him smart, very talented, a worthy negotiator with a great personality. The man you met today, Kim Jong-un, as you know, has killed family members, has starved his own people. Why are you so comfortable calling him very talented? Well, he is very talented. Anybody that takes over a situation like he did at 26 years of age and is able to run it and run it tough. I don't say he was nice or I don't say anything about it. He ran it. Very few people at that age You can take one out of 10,000 probably couldn't do it. These comments shock human rights advocates and outrage North Korean defector communities around the world. Some of his critics speculate President Trump has begun to genuinely admire Kim Jong-un, maybe even envy the total power he has as a dictator. In Pyongyang, the papers are plastered with photos of Kim standing alongside Trump, both of them flanked by US and North Korean flags. That's not something you see very often. This is propaganda gold for Kim. So even if he's returning without everything he wanted, he has history-making images to cement his legacy at home. After Singapore, discussions begin on arranging a second summit, and the letters between the two leaders get even more gooey. In one, Kim praises Trump for being endowed with an outstanding political sense. He says he cherishes having formed such an excellent relationship with a powerful and preeminent president. Trump seems smitten. This is him speaking to supporters at a rally in Virginia three months after that Singapore summit. And then we fell in love, okay? No, really. He wrote me beautiful letters, and they're great letters. We fell in love. The letters keep coming. Kim writes, I cannot forget that moment of history when I firmly held Your Excellency's hand at the beautiful and sacred location and hope to relive the honor of that day The whole world will certainly once again come to see another historic meeting between myself and Your Excellency, reminiscent of a scene from a fantasy film. Donald Trump replies in kind, saying, I have no doubt that a great result will be accomplished between our two countries and that the only two leaders who can do it are you and me. After months of uncertainty, the two leaders agree to meet again in February 2019, this time in Hanoi, Vietnam. Kim arrives on an armored train. It's a journey that takes more than 60 hours from Pyongyang through China to Hanoi. And it's a mode of travel that's a Kim family tradition. His late father was mythologized as working for the people on his iconic green train. President Trump, meanwhile, arrives on Air Force One in a bad mood. It's hot, and he's distracted by events in US politics back home. And these talks are going to be tougher than the ones in Singapore. 
Envoys brief Trump to let him know North Korea is offering to dismantle its main nuclear facility. But in return, they want significant sanctions relief. It's a big ask. Trump thinks once he gets in the room with Kim the following morning, the two men will be able to hammer something out. But Kim doesn't budge. And in the end, despite the sweet talk and the love letters, a deal eludes them. The mood turns sour and an impatient Donald Trump cuts the summit short. Their lunch of foie gras, snowfish and candied ginseng sits uneaten on the table. There was no deal in Hanoi, and, and I think, I hope, that part of the reason was that uh, Trump saw it was not in his interest to get into a bad deal. Better to walk away with no deal than to look like he had given away the store. But he wanted a deal. He did, and I, I thought it several times during both summits he, he was about to give away the store. Fortunately, it didn't happen, but it was close. There's no doubt about it. Four months later, Trump and Kim have a brief third date, Sort of. It's the kind of half-hearted, let's do coffee you do when you know a relationship isn't going anywhere. The US president is on a trip to Japan and South Korea, and he decides at the last minute to tag on a mini-meeting with Kim. It's a chaotic scene at the DMZ, with camera crews jostling to get their shot. But Trump, he's in his element. As cameras click away, he strolls toward North Korea and waits at the border for Kim to approach. After exchanging hellos, Kim Jong-un gestures for Donald Trump to come to his side of the DMZ. Trump smiles, he gives Kim a pat on the back, and then he steps onto North Korean soil, becoming the first sitting U.S. president to visit North Korea. It may look good, but after that handshake, working-level talks go nowhere, and the prospect of a deal soon fizzles out. It doesn't take long for the insults and hostile rhetoric to return. And to underline the end of this diplomatic love affair, North Korea launches a new barrage of ballistic missile tests. The country once again retreats into isolation. This is when John Bolton departs too, leaving his role as national security advisor. Bolton says he offered to resign. Donald Trump says he fired him. That's far from the only detail they recall differently. After John Bolton published a tell-all book about his time with Trump, the president published a string of tweets calling Bolton a sick puppy. He said his book was a compilation of lies and made-up stories and said Bolton was a disgruntled, boring fool who only wanted to go to war, adding that the statements the ambassador attributed to the president were pure fiction. But if Donald Trump was annoyed that a deal never came off with North Korea, then Kim Jong-un was furious. This was a major blow for him. I believe he fully expected to return home from Hanoi with a landmark political, economic, and nuclear deal. He envisioned stepping from his green train at Pyongyang Station, announcing a new era of friendly relations with the United States. That would have made all that investment in nuclear weapons worthwhile. But instead, he had to make that return trip empty-handed. And it must have been a grim journey for his aides, who had to sit with him for more than 60 hours, fearing the consequences they faced back home. Well, I think he really believed, and his advisors were telling him, and he thought that there was going to be a deal here. And the fact that it wasn't, I think, made him extremely unhappy. In fact, there are all kinds of rumors, speculations in the South Korean press later about officials being purged, and even worse, as a result of the lack of agreement out of Hanoi. John Bolton's talking about a news report in the South Korean daily Jozanilbo that claimed that several top North Korean officials were punished, even executed, in the wake of the Hanoi summit breakdown. We can't verify the reports, and to be honest, they're often inaccurate, but it's certainly the case that a few of those officials have not been seen or mentioned in state media since. So, put yourself in Kim's position. He's angry and in a corner. He'd built his nuclear weapons program to win a seat at the table alongside the world's superpowers. But apparently, it wasn't enough. Kim decides he has to step it up. He has to raise the threat so he can gain the upper hand in any future negotiations. I think what he wants to do, though, is get deliverable nuclear weapons as soon as he can. And I think that explains their expansion of their ballistic missile testing. I think they're trying to make as much progress as they can. But the economic sanctions are still biting, so how can he afford to go bigger? Well, keep in mind that while all these talks are happening, while Kim is sending love letters to Trump, 
while the missile testing is paused in a spirit of friendly cooperation, North Korea's cyber attacks have carried on unabated. The Lazarus Group didn't down tools and wave white flags. They've been busy. In the same month as the Singapore summit, June 2018, investigators say the Lazarus Group first breached the networks of Cosmos Bank in India. That's the ATM hack we covered in episode one. And the Hanoi summit happened just days after the attack on Bank of Valletta in Malta, the one where Hush Puppy laundered the money in Dubai. But Kim wanted, he needed more. Something even more lucrative than hacking into banks like Cosmos and Valletta. We're talking billions, not millions. Something even easier to steal and potentially harder to claw back. Something outside the traditional banking system, beyond the watchful eyes of sanctions inspectors. North Korea is about to come crashing in to the brave new world of cryptocurrency. That's next time on The Lazarus Heist. The Lazarus Heist is an original podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Jeff White. And I'm Jean Lee. Our producer is Viv Jones. Our original music was composed by Magnus Fines and Ie Wu from the South Korean band Jambanai. And as ever, we'd love to hear your feedback. Keep leaving us those ratings and reviews, and don't forget to follow so you don't miss any future episodes. And spread the word on social media using the hashtag Lazarus Heist. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>